Back in the 1960s, the American motorsport was an untamed battlefield of innovation, pride, and secrecy. Every manufacturer wanted to dominate Sunday races because victory meant showroom success on Monday. But behind the grandstands and roaring engines, a small group of engineers at Chevrolet, led by the legendary mechanic Smokey Eunuch, were preparing something extraordinary. It was an engine so advanced, it frightened officials and competitors. NASCAR demanded that 50 be built before it could race. Yet only 14 ever existed. What followed was a daring deception, a cover-up, and a mechanical masterpiece that would forever change American racing history. This is the untold story of the 427 mystery motor and the man who refused to play by the rules, sparking a technological revolution that changed American performance forever. In 1963, NASCAR's rules were clear and strict. If a manufacturer wanted to race an engine, they first had to prove that 50 identical units were built and made available for sale to the public. This rule, known as homologation, ensured that the machines on the racetrack were connected to the cars and showrooms. The fans needed to believe that what they saw speeding around the oval was something they could, at least in theory, buy themselves. Chevrolet knew these rules well, yet the company had ambitions that stretched far beyond compliance. They wanted to build an engine that could outclass every rival in speed, durability, and innovation. That dream became the 427 Mystery Motor. On paper, it was a version of their well-known W Series engine, but in reality, it was an entirely new design. It was lighter, stronger, and more efficient, and it used a head design that looked nothing like anything seen before in NASCAR. When Chevrolet submitted the paperwork for the Mystery Motor, everything appeared legitimate. The documents stated that all 50 required units had been produced and were ready for public sale. NASCAR's inspectors reviewed the files, saw nothing suspicious, and approved the engine for competition. But the truth was, Chevrolet had built only about 14 engines, perhaps even fewer. There were not enough to satisfy NASCAR's rule, and that was no oversight. It was a carefully planned deception that reached the very top of General Motors' racing program. Smokey Eunuch, the brilliant and rebellious mechanic from Daytona Beach, became one of the masterminds behind this illusion. Along with racers Rex White and Ray Fox, he helped orchestrate a plan that would fool NASCAR inspectors and keep the illusion of compliance alive. Whenever NASCAR officials scheduled an inspection, Smokey's crew would load a mystery motor onto a truck and move it from one shop to another across the Southeast each time. They would repaint it, add grime, and change small details to make it look like a different engine. The inspectors saw what they expected to see, and the deception when undetected Louis Clements and Rex White both recalled how the engines were secretly delivered to Smokey's shop under the cover of darkness. These deliveries looked more like covert military operations than corporate logistics. The secrecy was essential because Chevrolet knew the truth could destroy their entire racing program. Decades later, Hot Rod Magazine decided to settle some old scores with facts for their 50th anniversary coverage. They tracked down one of the surviving mystery motors and strapped it to a modern dynamometer for the first time in half a century. The engine fired up immediately, running smooth and strong despite sitting dormant for years. The dyno revealed output numbers that confirmed every rumor and legend about these forbidden power plants. This wasn't mythology anymore. This was measurable proof that the mystery motor deserved every bit of fear it generated back in 1963. The numbers told one story, but the engineering told another. To understand why NASCAR and GM's competitors were so terrified, you need to look inside the cylinder heads where Chevrolet's engineers had broken every conventional rule about internal combustion. At General Motors' Warren Technical Center, engineer Dick Keenath and his small team weren't just trying to build another powerful V8, they were chasing something far more ambitious. They wanted to completely rethink how air and fuel moved through an engine. Back then, most big blocks relied on wedge-shaped combustion chambers, and although they worked, they had serious flaws. The valves sat at awkward angles that restricted airflow and created turbulence which robbed engines of precious horsepower. Chrysler had already shown what could be achieved with its hemispherical, hemi heads. Those engines breathed beautifully, 
delivering huge power numbers that left competitors scrambling to keep up. The problem was that Hemi heads were complicated and expensive to manufacture. Their rounded chambers and intricate valve geometry required precision machining that wasn't practical for mass production. Kynath needed a smarter way, a design that could breathe like a Hemi but still be simple enough for Chevrolet to build in quantity. His solution became legendary. It was called the Porcupine Head, a nickname that came from the odd way the valve stems poked out at different angles, resembling the quills of a porcupine. This canted valve design tilted both intake and exhaust valves away from vertical, allowing air to flow in straighter pass. What looked strange at first turned out to be brilliant engineering. That small change in geometry transformed everything. Air and fuel could now rush into the cylinders with much less resistance, and exhaust gases could escape more efficiently. The engine breathed freely, which meant it made more power with less effort. On the dynamometer, a single four-barrel carburetor version of the mystery motor produced an astonishing 620 horsepower. To put that into perspective, Ford's best racing engines at the time were nowhere near that figure. But the real magic wasn't just in the peak power numbers. The torque curve was almost perfectly flat, meaning the engine delivered strong, consistent power across a wide range of RPMs. On NASCAR's high-speed tracks, where drivers needed both top-end speed on the straights and strong acceleration out of corners, that kind of balance was a game-changer. Chevrolet's engineers didn't stop there. They experimented with four different intake manifold designs, each with a unique approach to how air and fuel mixed before entering the cylinders. Smokey Unic personally tested all four versions and found one that stood out above the rest. For the first time, Chevrolet had an engine that could rival and even surpass Chrysler's mighty Hemis. Before the 1963 Daytona 500, Louis Clemens' team put one of the engines on the dyno. It produced 540 horsepower with conservative tuning, and when mechanics fine-tuned the carburation and ignition timing for race conditions, the power climbed even higher. These weren't myths or exaggerated garage tales. They were verified results from professional race shops, backed by hard data and careful engineering. What Kynath, Unic, and their team achieved was remarkable. They had taken a production-based V8 engine and turned it into something capable of challenging purpose-built racing motors. When Chevrolet officially introduced the Mark IV big block in 1965, nearly every lesson from the mystery motor found its way into that engine's DNA. The canted valve concept continued to evolve and would eventually power an entire generation of American icons, Corvettes, Camaros, Chevelle, and even heavy-duty pickup trucks. Every 396, 427, and 454 big block that followed owed its existence to the experiments carried out in secret just a few years earlier. The mystery motor may have been banned from NASCAR, but its legacy was unstoppable. It became the foundation for two decades of Chevrolet performance dominance, shaping everything from muscle cars to racing legends. Engineering brilliance means nothing without someone brave enough to unleash it. So when those mystery motors arrived at Daytona International Speedway in February 1963, they didn't just break records, they shattered the entire competitive balance of NASCAR in a single afternoon. The 1963 Daytona 500 was supposed to be a fair fight. Before the main event, NASCAR required drivers to qualify through two 100-mile preliminary races that would determine the final grid. Those races were designed to create drama and showcase close competition between manufacturers. But that year, there was nothing close about it. When Chevrolet's mystery motors took to the track, they changed the game entirely. Junior Johnson and Johnny Rutherford were behind the wheel, and the results stunned everyone. Their cars didn't just win, they dominated in a way no one had ever seen. Johnson's lap speeds reached an incredible 168 miles per hour, which was a full seven to 10 miles faster than the best laps from the previous season. On Daytona's massive oval, that difference was not just impressive, it was crushing. The Fords had the power, but couldn't close the gap on the straights. The Pontiacs tried to keep up in the corners, but had no chance of holding pace. 
Every team outside Chevrolet's camp was left staring at their stopwatches, trying to make sense of what had just happened. By the end of qualifying, five Chevrolets powered by the mysterious 427s had earned spots in the Daytona 500, and every single one looked capable of taking home the trophy. Among those cars, one stood out above all others, the black and gold Chevrolet that would become the most famous mystery motor machine in history. Its story began months earlier in Spartanburg, South Carolina, where Rex White and Louis Clements built its chassis during the off-season. They weren't simply bolting together spare parts or reusing old frames. They redesigned key components from the ground up, experimenting with suspension geometry, weight distribution, and balance. Their goal was to make full use of the mystery motor's immense torque without sacrificing stability at Daytona's extreme speeds. Once the car was completed, General Motors quietly shipped it to their proving grounds in Mesa, Arizona. There, under total secrecy, engineers tested it for weeks, fine-tuning every setting. Only after it passed those private tests was the car sent to Smokey Unix's garage in Daytona Beach for the final stage of preparation. Smokey inspected every inch, adjusted the aerodynamics, and perfected the setup for race day. This was no backyard project thrown together in a rush. It was a sophisticated corporate-level racing machine disguised as a private entry, an irony that made the story even more unbelievable after GM's so-called withdrawal from racing. As the season unfolded, it became clear just how rare these engines truly were. Teams shared the few existing mystery motors like sacred artifacts. Before the firecracker 400 later that summer, Louis Clements found himself in a tough position. His own car was out of competition, but he still had a freshly prepared mystery motor sitting in his shop. Instead of keeping it for himself, he decided to give it to Junior Johnson. There were no contracts, no payments, and no promises. He simply handed over one of the most valuable engines in existence because Johnson needed it more. That act of generosity reflected the unspoken code of racers during that era. They were competitors, but they were also part of a small, tight-knit community that relied on each other to keep the spirit of racing alive. Throughout 1963, similar exchanges happened quietly between the few teams lucky enough to have access to the forbidden engines. They shared knowledge, parts, and secrets, knowing they were fighting against both corporate power and NASCAR politics. Then came the shock that changed everything. Just as teams were preparing for the main Daytona event, General Motors officially announced its withdrawal from all racing activities. The company's public explanation sounded noble. They said they wanted to focus on passenger cars and comply with federal antitrust regulations. But behind the polished statements, the truth was much simpler. GM was protecting itself from government scrutiny that threatened to split the company apart. NASCAR suddenly found itself in an impossible position. They'd approved an engine based on homologation paperwork that was likely fraudulent and the manufacturer had just abandoned the team's mid-competition. Letting the mystery motors continue racing would expose NASCAR's inadequate inspection procedures. Banning them would admit they'd been deceived. Either way, the sanctioning body looked incompetent. And while NASCAR scrambled to contain the mystery motor damage, Smokey Eunuch was already 10 steps ahead. Because bending rules wasn't just what Smokey did occasionally, it was his entire philosophy of racing refined over decades into an art form that no rule book could ever contain. Smokey Eunuch's most legendary story began in a NASCAR garage, surrounded by inspectors, clipboards, and suspicion. After a race, officials ruled his fuel tank illegal and ordered him to remove it for inspection. Smokey didn't argue. His crew unbolted the tank and placed it neatly on the concrete floor. Then in front of everyone, Smokey calmly slid into the driver's seat, started the engine, and drove the car away. The inspectors froze, staring at the car rumbling down pit road without its fuel tank. How was it still running? The secret was genius. Smokey had installed an 11-foot-long, 2-inch wide fuel line hidden inside the frame rails. That line alone held nearly 5 extra gallons of gasoline. NASCAR's rulebook only mentioned the maximum size of the fuel tank. It said nothing about fuel line diameter, because no one had ever imagined someone would think of that. Smokey didn't just understand engines. He understood how people thought. He knew inspectors would only look for what the rule book described. 
not what it failed to mention. His famous basketball trick showed exactly that. During inspections, NASCAR checked fuel tanks by filling them with a known quantity of liquid. Before inspection, Smokey would secretly place an inflated basketball inside the tank. The ball displaced volume, so the tank seemed to meet the legal capacity limit. Once the car passed inspection, Smokey deflated the basketball and pulled it out through the fuel filler neck. Just like that, his tank could hold several extra gallons. The inspectors never suspected anything because, technically, their measurements were correct at the moment they took them. Another of Smokey's quiet advantages involved temperature rather than trickery. He discovered that if he cooled his race fuel to near freezing before filling the tank, the denser, colder fuel allowed him to pack in more energy per gallon. As the fuel warmed during the race, it expanded, effectively increasing capacity. That meant Smokey's cars could run longer between pit stops, giving him a crucial strategic edge. NASCAR eventually banned cold fuel tactics, but not before Smokey had used the loophole to dominate for years. In 1967, he unveiled what many still call his greatest masterpiece, the black and gold Chevelle that seemed to cheat physics itself. To the casual observer, it looked like a normal stock car. In reality, Smokey had moved the entire body backward by three inches on the frame, subtly shifting the center of pressure for better aerodynamics. He raised the floor pan to lower the roof line and reshaped nearly every body panel by fractions of an inch. Every change obeyed the rulebook, yet together they created a car that sliced through air more efficiently than anything else on the track. When NASCAR inspectors finally tore it down, they found so many hidden modifications that documenting them all became nearly impossible. Smokey hadn't broken the rules. He had simply rewritten the meaning of stock. But not all his ideas were about speed. Smokey cared about safety too. In the early 1980s, he proposed using tire walls around tracks to absorb impact and save drivers' lives. NASCAR dismissed the idea as unnecessary and expensive. Decades later, the sport introduced SAFER barriers built on the same principle. He also invented air jack systems in 1961 that could lift a car within seconds for faster pit stops. NASCAR banned them instantly, yet years later, the same technology returned as a standard innovation. Despite shaping modern racing more than nearly anyone else, Smokey Eunuch never entered the NASCAR Hall of Fame. His blunt honesty and constant clashes with the France family kept him permanently on the outside. But Smokey never cared much for politics. He wanted faster cars, smarter engineering, and a chance to prove that creativity could outthink authority. He didn't break rules for fun, he broke them to expose how incomplete they were. The principles Smokey Eunuch lived by continue to echo through modern racing. Today's NASCAR teams still study every line of the rulebook, searching for gray areas to exploit. They test components at the very edge of legality, just as Smokey once did. Each time NASCAR closes a loophole, engineers find another, keeping innovation alive under pressure. This endless game of cat and mouse between creativity and regulation began with Smokey's defiance. His approach became a philosophy that shaped not only race shops, but the entire culture of competitive engineering. Those 14 engines changed more than one season standings. They exposed NASCAR's outdated inspection system and forced General Motors to confront the tension between corporate caution and racing ambition. They proved that progress often comes from rule breakers who dare to think differently. Today, collectors treat surviving mystery motors like sacred relics. When one surfaces at auction, bids soar into six figures, and documentation of its racing past can double or triple its value. These engines are more than mechanical artifacts. They are time machines that capture the exact moment American muscle leapt forward. Smokey Eunuch passed away in 2001, still unfiltered and unrepentant. He never made peace with NASCAR's leadership, and he never received the official honors his innovations deserved, yet he didn't need them. His legacy is alive every time a race team finds a clever rule interpretation or a builder bolts together a big block. The engine NASCAR tried to erase became the one that defined generations. It may have been banned, but it never truly died. So what do you think? Was Smokey Eunuch a cheater or a genius who simply saw flaws in the system? Let us know in the comments below and hit that like button if you enjoyed this story. 
Subscribe for more untold legends from motorsports wildest era. Until next time, thanks for watching.